Welcome back to Media 7 where I'm talking with Alex Lee, Annie Goldson and James Muir about the state of the New Zealand documentary. James, when we uh, left at the end of part one we were talking about getting on screens and I, I'm quite interested in your experience because your film's been shown in a lot of small regional cinemas. Mm -hmm. How did that come to be and is it difficult to do that? Yeah, yes and no. Um, I think the main thing that's actually pushed it out to the regional cinemas has been that it's been picked up by, um, by groups such as Forest and Bird, uh, Fish and Game and the Green Party as well. Which is really interesting because we deliberately set out to make a film that was not um, political at all. We didn't involve, we, did, we didn't have any interviews with any of these, uh, these parties or, or uh, lobby groups and yet they picked up the film and took it to these places for us. Uh, there's been a few cinemas that I've, I've approached myself and then some other cinemas who have approached me and uh, mostly it's, it's been word of mouth and it's, it's been organic. Do you think it's done its job of advocacy? Has, has it changed anything? Yeah, it has. Um, a lot of people have rallied behind it. A lot of people have, uh, have used the film to say, actually, you know what, I believe in this as well. And a lot of people have come out and said to me, hey, um, I've experienced exactly the same situation as your father. So it's been very interesting. I knew that would be the case because I did understand the, the, the breadth and depth of the problem within New Zealand. However, it's been, uh, it's been quite heartening to, to have people come to me and say, look, you just, you just touched on something which is very dear to my heart and I've been concerned about for years because I've watched my river die as well. Annie, is, the, is that something you see as well as the job of documentary is to, to change the world? Is that what you're looking to do? Well, you know, I have had more modest um, ambitions like trying to prevent another genocide, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I that counts as changing the world, I think. I mean, there's never any way of sort of pragmatically measuring social change, I don't think. Mm. I mean, I think you do what you can and you get ideas out there and to learn about the world. I mean, to me, documentary is a medium that opens out, you know, rather than opening in. And I feel that just to consider history, to consider other cultures, to consider the environment is something that documentary can do. But whether it really, you know, I don't think it's possible to measure social change in that way. And that doesn't make it, I presume in your view, what Jeff Stephen, the former commissioner at, at TVNZ and TV3, described as spinach television. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know what he's been watching, but, you know, I last night went to two fantastic films as part of the festival. One was called Dancing with Dictators, which was a, the last Western... Um, newspaper editor in Burma and the other was called The Price of Sex which is about the new sex trade that's happening in the Ukraine and Bulgaria. Both of them really well made, really fascinating and actually at a strange level very entertaining, I mean engaging and tense. So all of the kind of sensations you go through watching a really good film I went through. Mm. And yet Alex on the other hand we're seeing um, programs funded for television that aren't so much spinach as chicken McNuggets. That, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're funded as documentaries, but, but they're not documentaries, are they? Are you concerned about that, that, that hmm. that's where the documentary funding goes? Reality TV? I, I think there's a place probably for reality TV, but as someone who believes in documentary, I think that we need to be very strict about what documentary truly is. And I think that, you know, mixing the two together is, is, is not giving due regard to the importance of documentary. So, you know, spinach TV in terms of reality TV is something that I don't think should be funded under a documentary strand. It should really be separate. You should have a strand that's totally for reality and a strand that's for pure documentary. Or well, maybe you can do that at the forum. Uh, now, this has been fairly gloomy, as I said, but James, I wonder whether you see any cause for cheer? I mean, I'm interested in the fact that you were able to make a cinematic film with digital SLR cameras. Yeah. You know, th those are not expensive HD cameras. Does, it, does that make you optimistic for the, that it's lowered the bar? Uh, yeah, when you say lower the bar... I well, lower the bar to entry. <laughs> yes, it, yeah. yes, it does. It makes it cheaper for people. Um, well, it, makes, it makes it affordable, for, especially for young people, to better actually come into the market uh, with, with a camera that they can uh, buy from a local camera shop and fit it out with some good lenses and get out there and start to shoot. I mean, the one thing that I think uh, all filmmakers, uh, young filmmakers, must remember is that film is two things. It's pictures and it's sound, and so you've got to have good sound as well. And so, you know, you've got to spend the money on, on that too, but even that has come down in price, and you can get really good sound recorders that will go along with your, uh, with your digital SLR, and then you get your editing um, suite as well, which will go along with that, and 
price-wise, it's, it's very affordable. You know, take a, a few months' work really to, to save up to buy it, and you're set. And you go out there. The difference now is that as a filmmaker working like that, you're doing everything. You're the producer, the director, the editor, the cameraman. You're absolutely the everything. Distributor. The distributor, which is very much yeah. the way you work too, Annie, isn't it? Well, I am pretty hands-on, I have to say, but I do worry also about people who are trying to support themselves as documentary makers to a kind of professionalised class, which I also think is important. And that's pretty difficult to do, I think, for, you know, mid-range career people. So, um... Is there anything that makes you optimistic about the form, about the future of documentary? Well, the good thing is, is people like James, I mean, there's always what I would consider a documentary spirit, and I think New Zealand has a very strong one. We have a strong tradition, like Canada and Australia, of loving documentary. And I think audiences really like it, as the New Zealand on screen, um figures testify to. So I think that encourages me. What discourages me is a couple of things. One is sometimes it's called the attention economy and the problem that the James's generation may face is there's just so much stuff out there is how do you get audiences and that can become very labour intensive mm. and whether the audiences can find it. And the other issue is the increasing commercialisation of our broadcast environment in particular. And whereas I'm not knocking the people that work in that environment necessarily. I do think what the supposed choice that the kind of commercial options give us actually narrows the range of possibilities rather than expands them and I think documentary becomes a casualty. Well we'll finish on a happier note now. Uh, we've talked a lot about the, the difficulties of documentary but it is as we mentioned also true that technology is lowering the bar of entry for people who want to tell their own stories. Jose Barbosa meets some young filmmakers doing just that. The mass availability of video cameras and other filming equipment has meant that people can start filming their own communities. For example, this is Vanya, and in the front that's Ashley. Now they're currently en route to start interviewing an athlete. This is Max Smith. They're talking to him because he's one of this country's most promising eSport practitioners. In other words, he's really bloody good at playing computer games. Vanya and Ashley are also gamers, and earlier this year they embarked upon an ambitious project. The year of 2012 is our focus, so we've got the players, so these players that train all day, they're going to tournaments around New Zealand, then we have the organisers who are running these tournaments, getting the sponsorship, then we have like the fans that turn up, you know, watch, support these players, so it's kind of encapsulating this year, we're getting all these different areas into one year, and we're hopefully trying to highlight something that maybe not many New Zealanders have seen or know about, it's kind of this like underground kind of thing. Under the moniker of the filming Archon, Ashley and Vanya are planning to deliver a fully realised documentary, completely canvassing the gaming scene in New Zealand. It's called Keyboard Athletes, and they've got a lot of ground to cover. Starcraft 2 is real-time strategy, so it's kind of like, it's basically economic warfare, very fast actions, a lot of mind games, it's kind of intelligence based, so that's one game. The other one is first person shooters, which a lot of people know, it's like shooting person, so you kill them, you win. Then the third one's like fighting games, which is like Street Fighter. So yeah, those are our main games. I remember playing Street Fighter 2 between deep fried Mars bars at Jacko's Fish and Chips in the early 90s. So it's quite nice to hear it's making a bit of a comeback. They do a thing called Rambats. Uh, so that's ranking battles where they just um, play in their own game against each other and then they climb up your ladder in preparation for their big tournaments. We followed them for a month and a bit um, and they were all training real hard for that and then we even went to this guy's home and like four of the boys from Rambats <laughs> were like just sitting on the floor and like their undies just jamming like Street Fighter and we're like whoa what the hell. However in general terms it appears as if the local scene has a lot of catching up to do. Well in Korea that's like the mecca of esports they have players that drop out of school they live in a team house with, like 20 players and they get up at 9 they train to 12 at night that's their life but New Zealand isn't like that, so a lot of the people have jobs, full-time jobs or university, but the one we just interviewed is very young, he's 15, he's got school, but he still trains like 40 hours a week, which is a lot. But just like any other sport, you put in the hours and you get the results, if you don't, you're not going to make it. The documentary is a low-budget affair, pulled along with whatever money they can scrape together from crowdsourced funding. So we've got $2,000 there, um, which is mostly just used for travel. It's just getting around is the big issue, because. That's what I've found so far, is just everything's on fuel. <laughs> There's no reason to think otherwise, but I do hope they finish the documentary. Films can have a unifying effect on the communities they feature, but only if the filmmakers themselves have their hearts in the right place. When pro players talk and they start saying, like, 
they just talk about how passionate they are for their game. And you're like, yeah, this is like, this makes me want to play. And then I guess that's what I want to do here with this documentary is like people to talk, like New Zealand players and then New Zealand people to be like, wow, this is, they're so passionate about what they do. And I want to get them behind the scene and I want to help support it and make it grow. Well, Alex, that's probably not going to be a cinematic documentary, but it strikes me there should be a way for, for the makers to get that two people and get it on screens and maybe even make some of the budget back. Are, are we going to get to that place? I think so. I think that uh, documentary film festivals or in, uh, any other type of film festivals try to celebrate the wide range of subjects. So a film like that certainly has a place in our festival, uh, but it just needs to tell a good story and it just needs to engage people. And if it's that, you know, we'll, we'll put it on. Well, personally, I'd like to be able to sit down in my lounge and choose to watch that one night. Uh, but that is our show. Thanks to Alex Lee, Annie Goldson and James Muir, and to you for watching. We'll be back with Media 7 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>